Do it <coughs> I think we should get going, otherwise we'll be uh, late again or I'll be chased out of this room and we don't finish the lecture as usual. So <laughs> let's change that pattern a bit uh, by starting seemingly early. We'll see how that goes. <coughs> anyway, so um, last session, um, most of you um, continued hopefully with the lab and finished up your setup. Um, there's no Mac people here. Um, so apparently the Mac crowd solved the issue of uh, not having the uh, triangle displayed and it could be related to or could be similar perhaps for some of the exotic uh, Linux uh, derivatives. So it may be worthwhile talking to each other because there seem to be some specifics <coughs> in the shaders that are res um, responsible for that purpose. Um, I further um, talked with um, Simon Myers about past these experiences and they said generally open source drivers are uh, not necessarily desirable for, for development. The reason is mostly that it's super hard to debug in a sense that you don't know if it's a driver or your uh, misguided uh, programming activities that, that lead you to those uh, you know, artifacts or missing elements or uh, geometric oddities or whatever else because open source drivers apparently are always um, in, or mostly incomplete with respect to the implementation. Yeah, okay. Okay, guys, half an hour attention, then we are off. And I need you a bit more, and then afterwards you can just go home and don't need to go to graphics. I promise uh, to pro mobile programming. I promise you. <laughs> Obviously, uh, that's not true. You probably need to go there. So, um, so it's another two hours of listening. But um, anyway. So now we want to get a bit closer towards programming or at least understanding the code that you wrote already or had to deal with at this stage. And again, I want to get that mechanics out of our way. So um, apart from knowing about the pipeline, we obviously, obviously want to program it. And um, so a few things that we need to know is about uh, OpenGL as a language, um, some of the concepts, the data types involved and um, how functions look like and so on. So. Um, yeah, let's go right into it. So again, in general, one of the key or core concepts that we're using or have been using quite intuitively is uh, um, a vertex, um, which is basically generally just the coordinates or conventionally it's uh, the location of it, but it can also be colors uh, or texture coordinates or whatever else. So something we explore later. The point is there. Uh, vertex is a kind of a generic or d quite general um, uh, data structure that you can use in different contexts. So don't be confused if you see it popping up in, in a different uh, concept. Um, generally, um, I, I'm pretty sure on GitHub it is. Um, I, I think it should be here too. Um, yeah, what else? Um, we have a Discord channel as well for chatting with master students. Um, so you can you can use it if you... I think I've posted the, the invite link, but it expires. So if you want to join and it expired, you can just send me a... put me an issue uh, in the issue tracker, right? Yeah. All right, so that's it for today. Unless there are some questions. Three and four dimensional vector representations that we're dealing with in um, uh, OpenGL. We get to the reason for that one uh, later on. Um, you can pretty much use any co uh, coordinate system of your choice as long as it's consistent, right, between all the individual models in the scene. But for clipping purposes, meaning for displaying purposes, Again, it will only be rendered within that um, range of minus one to one for the x-axis, y-axis, and so on, right? So we talked about this um, um, briefly before. So um, now it becomes a bit more messy, or let's say a bit more OpenGL-y, uh, in a sense that vertices are generally stored or rather referenced by um, vertex buffer objects, as they're called in, um, in, in OpenGL. And it uh, doesn't matter whether I used or not, it's just the base information that can serve as input for your programming, uh, for your pipeline execution eventually. Those virtual buffer objects are then organized uh, by uh, ver vertex array uh, objects um, that allow uh, them to actually introduce them for the use by, by shaders. So, um, and the idea there is quite um, straightforward. We'll explore that in a bit. Just want to, before we do that, I uh, want to go into the, some of the data types here. 
uh, that are available in OpenGL. And uh, similar to the functions, they have the prefix GL. So that's how you differentiate them from C++ uh, data types, for example. right? So everything's starting with a GL. So slightly different representation for you as a programmer in C++ doesn't make much of a difference. Um, you can't obviously pass a uh, GL float into a conventional flow that won't work, but you can pass it into the corresponding uh, OpenGL functions, which likewise uh, start with GL. You figured that out already as part of the lab, right? So those are the uh, data types we're dealing with. Any surprises there? Hopefully not. So now a word of warning before we, uh, before we, we uh, do more code. Sometimes on the web, and that's usually a good indicator where you should stop looking, um, you find that kind of code here, right? So you are creating a new uh, list of vertices, uh, you're beginning it, you want to render it ultimately as triangles, and then you specify the little vertices, finish up that list, and have it ready, right? This is the old syntax. So if you see that kind of stuff, your uh, GL vertex 3F and so on, this way of specifying it that's, uh, generally means you are in a tutorial which is a bit old. Um, you may not want to continue looking at this. Just a word of warning, because it's super easy to fall into that um, bracket. So, but instead, um, um, for the programming pipeline, we do it um, slightly, um, slightly different. So, first of all, thinking about the pipeline, um, the pipeline is pretty much a state machine, right? So, you um, produce or you generate um, input, or you prepare the input rather, uh, attach it to the um, vertex processing of the uh, um, OpenGL pipeline, and you basically pretty much just execute it uh, and can reference and modify that state. It's kind of, um, you can have multiple instances of the pipeline, for example, uh, and you, but the advantage is that you don't need to reference to any particular shader object or sub system or whatever else, you can directly operate uh, on it using GL commands, which makes it quite of convenient. Uh, but if you switch to that mode of thinking, it's actually quite straightforward um, to dealing with this. Uh, we have sequential execution, we may have side effects, meaning it makes you affect other uh, parts of the pipeline or your data um, and so on. Um, and as I mentioned before, the important thing is to realize that any output is basically in our previous stage is input for the subsequent one, right? So you have a filtering effect here that you actually continuously reduce certain um, um, a set of vertices that you want to render or print. For example. Cool. Um, one term I want to get about uh, or finish up on as well is double buffering. Uh, you guys, who, who knows double buffering? Did you learn it elsewhere? You guys are all reasonably. You actually don't need those lectures because you know more about those things anyway. Um, please. What? Yes, you know what I'm about, Frank. Can you, do you want to explore the intuition, even though it's on the board here? It's actually on the board. Well, it's more like they have two buffers. Yep. They can swap off. Yep, cool. And draw, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, what's the purpose? Um, the, you draw two in the same place. Yep. You get a more consistent uh, frame rate. That's another point, yes. That or for example, yep. vSync, mm -hmm. that, you, yep. that you make sure that you have really tight intervals where mm -hmm. the frames arrive to the, like, it doesn't vary mm -hmm. that much mm -hmm. based on the load. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's a really good, uh, good, good point. So you can actually control the, the frame rate, right? Because by swapping buffers more or less intentionally. You can also systematically reduce frame rate if you need to or want to, right? So that's that's a good point. I, I didn't think about this too much, but uh, what rather the idea is that while you're drawing, in worst case, you're still uh, um, rendering your individual pixels, right, for the output, and you don't want them, or you, want, you don't want your partial uh, printout being displayed on the screen yet, right? So for example, the screen updates is not in sync with your GL processing, and suddenly you have half of the screen rendered, half of it is not rendered, so you have weird artifacts, or some sort of tiering and so on, which you know from TVs anyway, this interlaced, uh, if you do a, 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 um, a, you know, a digital recording of a um, you know, CRT screen, for example, you see that interlacing effect. Yep, please. And I want to add to that. Yep. If you finish early yep. um, computing yep. the next frame, you can start on the next frame. You, can, yeah. you don't have to wait for the swap because you have an additional buffer. Yeah, we get to that. Uh, that would be the triple buffering element. Yeah, you, you're on the right I track. Mean, I mean the triple buffering. Okay, Sorry. good. good. Yeah. 
So, uh, so the idea of double buffering is we have one foreground buffer, one background buffer, right? Same size and same purpose. They are representing the entire screen, right? So screen output, and you're rendering to the back one while the front one is still displaying the old image, right? So once you're done with this one, you swap, and now you're writing to the back buffer in preparation for this next subsequent image or frame, rather. And the you know previously uh, developed one uh, or, or generated one is actually currently displayed, right? And you swap again. So that's double buffering. You continue swapping. The idea there is, okay, how can we improve performance further? The issue is that doing the swapping, there's no writing, right? So both buffers are busy. One of them is swapped to the foreground, the other one to the background. So the GPU can't write. Wasted time, right? GPU cycles wasted. The idea here is to use triple buffering. So you have a third buffer that is actually written to, so to uh, alleviate this um, delay that is caused by this extra swapping, right? You have a third buffer that you're actually writing to, and then you're displaying this one, and the other one can be written to while the other ones are written and swapped and so on. So you get a performance uh, advantage there. So you can continue, as you said before, before actually f uh, continuing the swapping, you can continue rendering already on the third buffer. Uh, yeah, third buffer. That's <coughs> triple buffering. But the only thing is, uh, why is it relevant for us? Because you will constantly need to swap windows. So it really depends on the... Uh, I probably should have done uh, put a brief excerpt of the APIs, how they do it, but um, this is done by the um, 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 GU GUI, uh, that's those utility frameworks basically, like SDL in our case, ULFW, or uh, whatever else you want to use, or GLUE, um, which we didn't talk about. I'll refer to them in the next session. Um, they will need to do that, right? It's not something that's done by OpenGL, that's actually you are saying, okay, or that framework is saying, well, now it's time to actually swap the buffers. You will, that's why uh, you will constantly need to call that uh, if you want to actually update your, your image. Um, so much about this. I just wanted to lose a few words on this uh, so everyone is on the same page. Um, so looking at the pipeline, getting closer, I think. So initially when using the pipeline, uh, you saw it in our code. If you, if you did the first lap, there should be a lot of things coming up and you see the pattern here. You uh, initialize the um, OpenGL instance you are working you're dealing with, right? So whether you have a compatibility profile or the core profile, you may have seen that the version, major, minor version, you want to have initialized <coughs> on your um, uh, for, for 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 input, and then you organizing the uh, input, um, adding some input buffer, and actually filling this. Um, we get to that. Then you. Obviously, plug in some shaders, which was implicit in the first lab. Again, we do that next week. Have a look at this, um, which are basically uploaded to the GPU. And in fact, this is uploaded to the GPU as well. Um, and then finally, you actually draw whatever has been uh, input there and is operated on based on shaders, uh, will actually be drawn. And you afterwards um, detach from the input. So you can have various inputs that are rendered to the screen. For example, you have, think about it. Um, So this is your, your screen, and you can have potentially, here's the pipeline. You could have potentially different buffers feeding into the screen for processing. Between different frames, you use different information. For example, this one has position information, this one has texture information, the third one has color information. So it's really up to you how you do it. That's why you basically activate an input buffer for example, this one here, for the actual processing, you do the processing, you deactivate it afterwards, and for example, this one is activated and processing is done. That's why you have an explicit reference to the deactivation of the input. We get to that uh, in code in a second. And afterwards, you actually need to swap the window. So here's SDL, the framework of choice, and that actually moves whatever picture has been rendered into the foreground, right? So then the back buffer is available to be filled again with, uh, with further information. All right. So, how does it actually work? So at the core of it is the, what is called the vertex area object. Um, and this is kind of ties up everything that we are uh, dealing with. Do I have anything for removing? So um, vertex array object has um, some sort of index. Um, further parameters, I fill them up once we get there. It probably makes a bit more sense. Um, and then here, 
Zero is more appropriate. Eight points. <coughs> to buffer object. So um, let's do um, it this way. We have. Um, So let's assume that this uh, base buffer object basically represents a um, set of vertices. In fact, two vertices of um, um, three dimensions, right? So we have x, y, z. We have x, x, y, and z, right? So we have two um, vertices represented here. So it's not quite a triangle, but we could make a line out of it, whatever else we want, right? So, and the Vertex error object, or VAO, as you'll find in most references, um, has some sort of identifier that's registered in the, um, uh, in the pipeline processing, so uh, when it's generated, and which basically then links to the appropriate buffer. Uh, and we see the parameter that it uses to fill it up in a, in a very set second. And the first thing we basically do here is to generate this uh, overall um, a vertex array object uh, with reference to specific um, entries that are available that point to um, vertex buffer objects afterwards. And the functions you're using to do this is uh, GL gen vertex arrays um, and uh, GL bind vertex array afterwards. The idea is there you have uh, some sort of identifier that you uh, refer to when you generate a given number of um, uh, arrays, right? So we only generate one right now, but you can generate up to, depends on your implementation generally, anyone? Any number in mind? I think 16 is uh, the conventional implementation, but it depends. You can ask the context uh, constant, I think it's called uh, GL uh, max VO or something like that. It will actually display the maximum supported uh, inputs you can generate. Cool. So we only generate one here right now, and afterwards we actually bind it for use. We tell the system, okay, this will be now be available uh, for use for potential rendering ish, right? At this stage, however, there's no reference to any underlying data structure yet. It's just generating this entry there, right, which is at the core of um, the processing pipeline. At the next stage, we're generating the vertex uh, buffer object, and this is in my simple representation right now. This thing down here. So it's a um, buffer object. We again, again have a number of them that we have. We need to have a reference to them. And again, we bind them to the actual pipeline, right? We can generate them. Doesn't mean they're actually bound for use. Yeah. Uh, same pattern here. So uh, identifier generation, we only create one of them. We uh, do it um, by reference. Then we'll bind the buffer and we bind it to the GL array buffer. The point is, in OpenGL, there are various buffers for different purposes. Um, for example, um, for, for color buffer, uh, texture buffers, and so on. But we're just interested in the rendering, um, which is the GL uh, array buffer. So meaning any input that's somewhat produced here will be uploaded to the, uh, this buffer and thus subsequently displayed as part of the um, display. I'll move my beautiful rendering environment. Please. When you generate the buffer, yep. isn't it already on the GPU? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's already on so its view. It's a bit misleading that uh, the comment there where it says upload the data from the CPU to GPU because that's right, it's that's already right. there. That's right, it's basically a comment that I uh, uh, blindly overtook. You're right. Yes, um, and the bind, as yeah? the way I understood it, is yeah? sort of like activate you. You say right. this is the active one. Yeah. If you bind again, it changes yeah. the active. So that's right. The one who was bound. Yeah. It's not no it's unbound. Bound. Yes, that's you right. You can only have one buffer bound. bound at a time. That's correct. Um, yes. You have many buffers. That's right. So, so if you have many buffers, that's what I meant before. So you can basically swap between them. We, we get to that as well. Um, there is advantages and disadvantages to them. So obviously the binding and unbinding process takes considerable time. So that's one other way you can deal with this by basically having vertex uh, some some input. Um, For example, if you want to represent um, um, vertex and color, you can basically interleave them uh, this way. 
uh, uh, Z, right? So you don't necessarily uh, only need to have a uniform representation of a particular within a particular vertex buffer, but you can have interleaf information. For example, you're only interested in the position right now or only interested in the color, so you work with offsets within the buffer, but use fundamentally the same buffer, so you don't have the overhead of binding and unbi or unbinding and rebinding a different buffer object. Yeah. So, but we, we get to that in a second. Uh, as usual, you guys are a bit ahead. Um, uh, one second. Yep. Uh, first, um, are you supposed to be streaming to GTL now, or are you recording? Because on GTL YouTube, it says uh, it's a graphics uh, like this lecture, but Mario is just lecturing on something else. Then he ho then he hocked <laughs> my stream. I'm actually streaming to it. Okay. <laughs> Are you recording as well, or just no? Oh, I'm, shit. I'm, I'm, I'm not recording it, um, but it's probably now I'm doing. Uh, I suspect he will not be recording right now. He's probably just setting it up and uh, perhaps moderately. No, it looks like he's talking to a bunch of people. It's our class. We're having like 15 minutes together, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> bad luck. So, um, so. Suggestion attend that class. Probably I need to come up with a new channel, right? Eh? I have my own. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe team. have separate ones. Yeah. That would be. Yeah, screw that. It doesn't work. We don't have the channel in the global school. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, we share our channel, which is kind of semi stupid, yet okay. Shared it, variables. That's right. <laughs> that's right, yeah. We're <laughs> fairly, fairly unorganized <laughs> in that respect. Okay, um, yes, yeah, I shall fix um, that, that kind of issue. Cool. All right, so we have those two things, vertex area object, buffer object, and since before we're running out of time, um, I want to finish up that thought. So we obviously need to fill that um, um, somewhat, right? So we need to fill the buffer with vertices. Here right now, I did the shortcut and said, well, you know, that's the vertex buffer object and has all the um, stuff in it already, but it's obviously not the case. In fact, it's filled by some sort of with some sort of input data, right? So an array of um, x, y, and z coordinates, for example, right? So it's something uh, like you, you guys um, did as part of the first as part of the first uh, lab. Hang on, RGB. Uh, so that's pretty much the, the input you're getting. So that's that is uh, where we're still on CPU level first because that's actually coming from C plus plus, right? So it's the input data you're actually consuming. And you need to indicate, so that's the function we're using, and this would be basically the uh, input, x, y, z, x, y, z. Um, we need to um, say what we're actually pointing to. So we're pointing to the array buffer that's yeah, responsible for um, uh, the, the display output. We are uh, referencing, obviously, a data we want to uh, put in in their size um, and um, what kind of drawing it is. And, it tells the system whether it expects uh, frequently updated data or rather static data, meaning it doesn't actually need to do lookups anymore in, uh, or it doesn't need to uh, update data coming from the vertices input um, because it's only uh, printed once, for example. But we uh, see that later on. More importantly, is the vertex attribute pointer because this kind of explains the semantics of, uh, or rather the syntax uh, or structure of the input data that we're getting. As I mentioned before, um, so one of the things is, what's the layout identifier in the shader later on? So that's super important for uh, later processing. Um, I will re-emphasize that in a second again, because that will be relevant for next week. Because this is just the entry point of the pipeline, right? But further down the track, I'm not sure if anyone sees any stream here, but I will pretend I care for the streaming people. <laughs> so um, recall. That this is basically the input, and let's say we have the vertex shader here, vertex shader here. Uh, we need to be able to reference the input we're basically getting, right, in the vertex shader further one stage down here, because what this basically does um, is linking it to the vertex area object, which may have an arbitrary number of entries, but we actually need to tell the shader which ones of those to consume eventually, and this is precisely that identifier, yeah, the location identifier that we'll be dealing with. Um, so then we need to have the size. What's a generic, uh, no, what's the number of components that represent one vertex, right? So in this case, we're saying uh, it's three, x, y, z, right? But we could have a fourth dimension, for example, or we could have um, color information as well. So if we had RGB here, so suddenly we would have a size of six, right, for one element. Does that make sense? Good. Um, what else do we have? What's the data type? Surprise, surprise. In this case, it's float, right? So it could also be integer, unsigned integer, and so on. 
Do we want to normalize um, some data? So meaning it basically explores the depth range of available data, so the data range, and um, compresses the data within that range. So for example, if you are, um, as we, do it, we do it later on when we get to that, um, makes, more, uh, makes, makes more sense. So basically, um, but by default, um, you would sort of say no, meaning don't manipulate any of my data, right? So no internal manipulation at this stage. Um, and then there is the idea um, of the concept of the um, strike. And here, again, it looks at the structure of the data because if you, for example, use the same input, bu input buffer here, but want to use it um, in, uh, for different locations in the vertex area object, you can do so. So let's say, if I change that here, point to that one down here, um, one of the parameters we're dealing with, for example, is uh, strike here, we get to that one. So we have size, for example. So let's work on this particular example. We have a, um, um, we want to, for example, in buffer zero, we want to represent only the um, x, y, z coordinates. So the three coordinates. So the size will be three. Um, what else do we have? I will only concentrate on the rele relevant elements. So we have the index, we have the strides, we have, um, oh, we need to have the strides. And the strides is basically indicate the space between uh, individual generic um, vertex components. So and if we had the, we, if we wanted only to represent the vertex coordinate x, y, and z, we don't care about color, but uh, unfortunately our object here vertex bar um, buffer object includes also color information. The stride indicates the space between each generic vertex component. And in our case, it would mean we have gaps of three between each of the vertices in the array. Yeah? So we would have a stride of three here. Uh, and the other important thing is the offset. Where do we actually start processing the triangle? Here we're interested in vertex information, so our <coughs> offset would be zero. We're starting from the first position, right? If we do the same one for this one, assume we want to represent only color. Uh, similarly, so our element size is three, so always three components. The stride between is also three, but we're dealing with an offset of um, two, right? Get it right. So, um, cool. That makes sense. Um, three. So, so meaning the, the idea here is, this is quite powerful, you need, to, you need to get that right. You need to identify, okay, what constitutes a vertex or something I want to process. It doesn't need to be a vertex just to get that right. You can also process a vertex plus color plus texture information in one go and see that as your unique you know, uh, uh, um, data unit, if you like, right? Because in the end, you need to deal with that code anyway. In the vertex data, you get all that as input and you need to work on that, right? So how you do it then depends totally how you implement your vertex data later on. Again, remember this one will be the identifier, how you identify all that content in the vertex shader further down the track. Yeah. Is that somewhat clear what happened here? Or totally unclear? Or fix, can I somewhat fix my bugs here? My conceptual bugs. Um, no harm though, because this code is basically stolen from the lab one. So if you look at the lab one again, and you start playing with it, especially if you if I'm not sure if you, have, if you haven't done it yet, but the lab uh, 1a kind of amendment, have a play with this one, you'll um, need to understand exactly that down there, right? Because so we're dealing with all those uh, elements there. Um, cool, yeah, I just came up with the example. So assuming that we, for example, have strikes, um, the, um, we are, we have, for example, vertex buffer and texture data uh, in, uh, in, in some sort of input buffer, and we have a data type of float. A float has uh, four bytes. What's the strike size? Anyone? What's the size of uh, the, the entire data and uh, one unit of the entire data representation? Twenty. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we have just twenty bytes basically represented. I simplified it over there, but that's the um, way you would uh, represent it exactly. Um, 
So, following, coming back to our my little pipeline exercise. So we now have the British array object that references data, and we have identified the structure to some extent in the data set. Now we want to actually uh, draw it to the screen, right? So, and the idea is there, we need to um, enable a particular attribute arrow input. It happens to be the identifier there as well. So we say, okay, use that one, whatever is in there, with all the structural specification that happens for input for drawing. So we do this one. Then we actually call the draw um, function. So it means now draw it, right? Now, in <coughs> this parameter, suggests the geometric shape you want to um, generate based on the vertex input you get, right? So um, we talked about it briefly last time, but the idea is there, if you have GL triangles, well, you need to have three vertices, right, that are shaped in some sort of, and you produce some sort of triangle out of this. Could also be GL points, GL line, uh, and so on, some other ones of this. And this one is the offset you're starting from uh, reading, so you may, for example, omit, you know, the first one or two vertices if you want to, and what the uh, number of um, vertices are uh, you want to read, right? So in this case, for example, you only want to use the first, uh, you, you have a, a 20 vertices, you only want to use the first five, you can indicate it here, right? So the system will, only, or the rendering will only perf perform, the, uh, operate on the first five of those. It's always about having a buffer with data input that you ideally don't need to modify, but instead you're just modifying the references to that buffer, right? Either by having multiple um, indices with a ver um, vertex array object, or you mo you're operating within the buffer uh, directly. That's the alternative. Okay, um, following this one, you disable the input. That was what pretty much you were saying before. Um, so now, you know, for the next iteration, that's one loop iteration, we actually may want to use another um, vertex attribute array. So it may be, for example, one with the index one for the next iteration. So then you do the drawing, again, you deactivate it. So it always comes in a in, in a complementary um, uh, execution. And then here is the double buffering, that's swapping the windows. Yeah? But this is not done by OGL natively, it's in fact done by STL. So it really depends what framework you use. If you're using GLFW, just find the corresponding function, do the swapping, you're done. Right? So it's, it's no biggie, that's, that's uh, for us not the main, the main concern. But this is the aspect that's uh, more important. Cool, again, a pointer to that uh, identifier there. So the geometric primitives that are all available, for example, are those ones, the more common ones. I think they're continuously extended in OpenGL uh, to some extent, but those are some of the more uh, uh, general ones because like triangles, you can use triangles to represent pretty much anything anyway. Uh, and you can just basically indicate whether you want to see points, line strips, line loops, triangle strips, and so on. There's a virtualization here as well. Um, to, to represent that. You just want to show points, individual lines. If that's the case, then um, the vertices are uh, interpreted in pairs of two, and then lines are formed between those, so they're not connected. If you have a line strip, it will connect all the individual vertices. If you have a line loop, it actually will connect the last, the last vertex with the first one as well, again. And um, it has, in fact, a similar effect like a polygon, which does the same thing, because the idea is, or well, polygon is that it's a closed circuit of linked uh, vertices anyway, right? Um, cool. So if you do run the three triangles, it will take the um, first three vertices and make one triangle out of those, and the next ones, another triangle, and so on. And, um, yeah, there's some points. Uh, what happens if the number of vertices you have is not divisible by two? Yeah, then you're kind of in trouble. Um, it depends on the implementation, how it reacts, but generally that's precisely those things you want to figure out carefully. So uh, try it out, it should break more or less aggressively. I, I, uh, some implementations will capture that issue, um, but yeah. Um, you can also find this in uh, 3D modeling, for example. Okay. Uh, if you have uh, more vertices, or your vertices are not divisible by three, you will have an impossible shape. Yeah. You will not be able to render this shape. Yeah. And you have to fix it before you can really do anything with yeah. it. Yeah, you probably see uh, just a background screen, nothing else, right? So I think that's the most, uh, the general response in object. Did you try it? I tried uh, drawing triangles with 11 vertices and yeah. it just skipped the last two. Oh, cool. So that's cool. Yep. Yeah. So that's an easy way out. So, um, and there may be different uh, forms there, right? So if you have a triangle strip, it will take the last two vertices. So if we have 0, 1, uh, 1, 2, so on, 
it will connect start the next or align the next triangle um, or extend the next triangle adjacent to those last two um, uh, vertices, right? So we have uh, vertex one, two, three forming next triangle, two and three being the basis for the next triangle, three and four the basis for the next triangle, and so on. That's considered a strip. And then if your fan idea, well, the fan idea is always uh, linking um, the last vertex and the first, very first vertex. So you have a fan structure emerging based on this one or a quadratic um, variance as well. I don't, I'm not sure if it's supported um, um, in our um, framework right now because I was trying to draw it and wasn't really successful. Um, cool, but that's something you probably can uh, explore a bit more. But it makes sense, right? No magic there? Cool, yeah, good. Um, final word on the game loop. Um, so just to get that right, so when you want to execute, uh, execute and want to modify input uh, and render a new frame, the cycle is basically only the element of activating a particular attribute um, pointer, the input um, pointer from the vertex area object, doing the extra drawing using those geometric primitives, the activation of the attribute pointer, swapping the window to the background, for, to the foreground, potentially modifying the vertices if you want down here or not, and then a loop again, right? So that's the entire loop you deal with. The entire setup is done once, when it's all tied up, like the, the mechanics in, um, of uh, VAO, VBO, and the underlying data, then you would just need to modify the data and just um, yeah, indicate which of those um, input errors you actually want to, um, or attribute inputs, you actually want to uh, render to the screen, right? So meaning it's more like setup and parameterization, but afterwards uh, it becomes a lot more feasible. So the game loop is effectively that bit here anyway, right? So you are activating some input, drawing it, deactivating it, swapping the window, activating the next input, and so on, yeah? Cool. So that was pretty much uh, it for today. I uh, just want to give you an overview. Is that somewhat clear? And... Um, if I would encourage you, especially if you are, want to reinforce it, have a look at the lab again, because it's exactly there in there. So it's pretty much near the code I took from there, but you find the same structure. But hopefully now it makes a bit more sense what's actually happening behind the scenes in terms of how the system is uh, organized, that you have this index element, you have the buffers associated with this, the input data that feed into the buffer objects, and uh, the activation of the corresponding uh, entry. Um, and this will be particularly important for later on, because here, again, this index will be the, uh, one of the input uh, parameters here, so you actually know which input data you're operating on for vertex shaders. I'm just saying that right now because you may get, just get a lab on Monday with deals with uh, vertex shaders, and we actually didn't talk about it, but at least you have a starting point there, plus we obviously will give you a brief primer on what's happening there because of this interleaved lecture lab thing, right? Originally, I intended to have a lecture ahead of the lab, which would be super cool, but I'm not sure how to fix it on the short term right now because I want you guys to be as uh, coding as quickly as possible, basically. So you guys can you know, start doing stuff and then I do the boring bits. Um, cool. Right. So yeah, that next session we look at those two ones, uh, vertex shaders and fragment shaders, how to program and use them. Um, but for, it, for today, that's uh, pretty much it. Thoughts, questions, worries? It's a bit of a long session, I know. But as I... I uh, Admire your endurance. No? Some of you are still alive. Who's playing games here, anyway? <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. you have a. <laughs> when are the projects? Um, we'll um, plan to end them out after the. probably next Friday, roughly. I want to give you the first assignment so you know actually what to do. But, but then you'll also have the necessary. Uh, you know, functionality to actually do it, or uh, most of it, in fact, right? So all the rest you can figure out yourself. That's the keyboard handling, blah, 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 that stuff. But at least you have the mechanics you can start thinking about the uh, concepts right now it doesn't really make full sense uh, yet i think um but thanks for the reminder so i have something to do for the weekend um <laughs> no no other concerns anyway if you have questions next uh, monday we we'll probably have a mini session and you can ask some uh, questions or raise some concerns uh, about <coughs> what we talked today cool cheers uh, see you in about 15 minutes <laughs> which room are we in <laughs> <laughs>